Okay, so um, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, first, to avoid any disappointment, I should warn you that this presentation has nothing to do with the popular Netflix show. Um, what I do want to discuss today is Herodotus's biography of Cyrus in book one, adopting the framework of Marshall Salins's comparative observation concerning stranger kings. Now, some of this will be familiar terrain. After all, Cyrus's presence as a foreign ruler in Median, Babylonian, and Hebrew sources is well known, as are the commonalities between Herodotus's account of Cyrus and the hero legends describing founders such as Sargon of Akkad and Romulus of Rome. However, although I will cover some well-worn territory today, I hope to demonstrate that Salins's reflections and theorization on stranger kings and stranger politics may cast some new light on Herodotus's Cyrus and perhaps on kingship in the ancient world more generally. And in particular, I will explore the idea that Cyrus's foreign status was not something the hero legends attempted to conceal, but rather something they embraced as part of a widely held belief that power emerges from outside society. Um, secondly, and again following Salins's lead, I will discuss how Cyrus's empire and his conquest of the Medes and elsewhere, rather than an example of rule by domination, may be better understood as rule through the creation of a contract. Um, and I'm going to start off quite generally. If I can just get my slides. OK. So I'll start off by discussing the intellectual origins and defining features of Salins's concept of stranger kings. Following this, I'm going to turn to an extensive case study on the strangeness of Herodotus's Cyrus the Great, before concluding with some general reflections on the utility of understanding Herodotus's account through Salins's framework. Now, as the title of this presentation suggests, I'm going to talk a lot about Marshall Salins today. And one reason for that is that Salins's reflections and kingship are theoretically interesting, and I also think a useful means of interpreting Herodotus' Cyrus narrative. But secondly, because this paper is intended as something of a belated tribute to the recently deceased, and for me at least, the most influential anthropologist of recent times. And really, to describe Salins as influential is something of an understatement. So Salins can lay claim to having made substantial contributions to economic anthropology, practice theory, evolutionary anthropology, Anthropology, anthropology and history, and the list goes on. And on the left hand side there, you can see some of his major and discipline defining works. Now, if this impressive contribution to anthropology wasn't enough, Salins was also no stranger to the ancient world, and his friendships and engagements with giants like Moses Finley, Jean Pierre Vernant, and James Redfield, among others, resulted in fruitful dialogue which frequently juxtaposed Fiji with ancient Greece. Um, and notably, this dialogue went both ways. So again, as many of you here know, um, Salins is frequently adopted into classical discussions on a range of topics, including Melanesian and Polynesian big men as analogies for Homeric Basileus, Greek and Hawaiian understandings of encountering divinity, and more recently, interpreting kinship as the mutuality of being. Perhaps a high point in this interdisciplinary dialogue emerges in Salon's later years when he addressed classical subjects head on, including a thought provoking article on Spartan dual kingship and a magnificent, if at times sprawling book comparing the Peloponnesian war with an analogous war between a land and sea power in Fiji. Marshall Salon's apologies to, to Thucydides has received mixed reception among classicists. And indeed, despite our love for Herodotus, some of you may not be comfortable with Salins's attempt to cast Thucydides as the father of a history which removes culture in favor of a universal and ahistoric understanding of human nature. However, the vilification of Thucydides aside, this work remains an invaluable summation of Salins's thought on fundamental anthropological issues such as culture and agency, and includes some pretty memorable digressions on Bobby Thompson's home run in 1951 and Jean-Paul Sartre's biography of Flaubert. But chiefly, apologies of Thucydides earned its status as a classic for its spirited defense of Salins' long-running claim that human action rather than being governed by underlying and universal ideas of human nature, be the evolutionary instincts, Hobbesian psychology, or Foucauldian power, is something always mediated by culture. And this is a theme we're going to return to frequently today. Now, we could spend all day talking about the relevance of Salins' research to understanding classical antiquity. Today, however, I want to discuss 
only a small part of it, Salinas' reflections on stranger kings. And this is a subject which, though arguably minor by Salinas' royal standards, has occupied an important and continuing role in Salinas' theoretical output. So as you can see from the works listed on the left, Salinas' reflections in stranger kings begin as early as 1981, then there's a slight lull, and then they're picked up repeatedly from 2008 onwards before culminating in the wonderful 2017 collaboration with the, again, unfortunately, recently deceased David Graeber. And during this 40 or so years of research, the value of Salence's reflections in Kings has been repeatedly recognized by historians the world over, and more recently as well among classical scholars. In fact, um, after proposing this topic to the helpline, I noticed that a forthcoming conference is going to be dedicated to Stranger Kings in Antiquity in the University of Exeter. So mark this in your diaries, it's going to take place in November, I think. Um, so why is this concept so important? And what exactly does Salence mean by Stranger Kings? Well, the idea itself, it's fairly simple. As Salins puts it in his 1981 article, it is a remarkably common fact that the great chiefs and kings of political society are not of the people they rule. By their local theories of origin, they are strangers. Consider, for example, and actually there'll be a lot of examples today, the following Fijian narrative. So I'll quote Salins' summary. You have it here on the right as well. The first man was brooding on killing his wife as she was getting old and replacing her with their three daughters. But one day a handsome young stranger, victim of an accident at sea, was cast upon the shore and discovered by the, by the daughters. His name was Tabua, which is also the name of Fiji's greatest valuable, the sperm whale toot, a chiefly thing as Fijians say. The daughters desired Tabua and offered to become his wives. The angry father, however, required the stranger to accomplish a miracle in order to win his daughters, which Tabua succeeded in doing by means of a cunning trick. The old man was not only defeated, but sexually humiliated, as in glee his wife plucked out his beard, a customary sign of virility affected by mature men. Reluctantly, he yielded his daughters and his supremacy to the stranger, but only on certain conditions, most notably that all subsequent strangers who wash ashore be eaten lest, like Tabua, they trouble the land. We have here the basic components of a Stranger King narrative. So note first the presence of the malevolent native ruler, the appearance of a handsome stranger, the presence of an impossible challenge or battle set by a local ruler, often accomplished through trickery, and what results in almost all cases is the stranger's marriage to a local aristocrat and the formation of a new state. Now, it's fitting to begin our discussion with a Fijian na narrative. Indeed, Salins quite likely first encountered this kind of tale during his fieldwork and historical research in Oceania, especially in Polynesia and Melanesia. However, as is evident from the title of his 1981 article, Dumazil Among the Fijians, Salins also owes an equal debt to classic classicists and comparativists, such as, well, obviously Dumazil, but also Arthur Morris Hocart and James Fraser, who in different ways discuss stranger kings in the Indo-European tradition and in fact beyond. In his later discussions on the topic, Salins actually widens this field considerably. As Salins puts it in the introduction of his 2017 work on kings, Stranger kingdoms are the dominant form of the pre-modern state the world around, perhaps the original form. Now, this is clearly a bold claim to make concerning societies, many of which, as Solomon is well aware, possess no historical connections whatsoever. It's also a claim that I'm unqualified to assess. However, when it comes to the ancient Mediterranean and the Near East, I think that most of us here can think of at least a few examples. So in Rome, we have the stranger Aeneas's flight from Troy and marriage to the local princess Lavinia. And Aeneas, as is well known, was only the first of many ethnically foreign kings that would go on to rule the Eternal City. Greek stranger kings are equally common, an example frequently cited by Solon of Pelops. So Apollodorus's, uh, Apollodorus, the mythographer, he outlines how the king of Pisa was warned that he would be killed by the husband of his daughter. The king thus cleverly puts all the suitors to death through a rigged chariot race. Pelops, however, through the use of deceit, wins the race and takes the crown. Now, I'll stop here. But even without rehearsing the descendants of Pelops or the kingships established by the Heraclids, we could go on for quite a while. So if you are, however, eager to see more amidst of Stranger Kings, you can check out Gruen 2010, Finkelberg 2005, or indeed most of the articles by Solens in the bibliography on the handout. 
Now, Stranger Kings are equally at home in Near Eastern narratives, Indo-European or otherwise, and in fact, one of the most celebrated accounts in Near Eastern tradition, and one I will return to later, is found in the birth legend surrounding Sargon of Akkad. Now, the sources are fragmentary, but the gist of the story, much like those outlined above, describes how Sargon was born of mixed ethnicity. His mother may have been a priestess and his father an unknown hillsman. On his birth, Sargon was placed in a basket in the Euphrates and carried away to a gardener called Aki, who reared him as a son. Though the details are obscure, in what follows, Sargon, with the help of the goddess Ishtar, defeats the king of Kish and takes the crown. Now, again, there are much more examples. And if you want to read further ones, you can check out Michalowski's Salon's inspired article, The Domestication of Stranger Kings, Making History in the List in Ancient Mesopotamia. Um, now, Salon's contribution is obviously far more than simply drawing attention to this widespread, to the widespread prevalence, prevalence of this idea. Rather, it consists chiefly in theorizing why so many societies would want to attribute foreign origins to the kings in the first place. And I think that this is a puzzle worth dwelling on, particularly in societies where succession would a sing within a single royal genealogical line is considered to represent the ideal. As I will later document, one of the most common understandings of stranger king narratives is that they represent ideological tales and reveal efforts by the foreign powers that be to legitimize their rule. Now for Salons, legitimizing may well be part of the story behind the existence and spread of Stranger King narratives, but it is hardly an exhaustive explanation. So for a start, Stranger King narratives the world over are not the sole prerogatives of colonial rulers. On the contrary, they appear, they appear to be as popular among the conquering party as they are among the conquered. Secondly, the, legit, the legitimizing function of these narratives is sometimes more difficult to discern to discern than it is often claimed, especially in cases where historically it seems doubtful that any conquest took place. And finally, and I think most importantly, if conquerors are indeed trying to legitimize their actions through myth, what precisely are they trying to legitimize? Although proponents of legitimacy claims often argue that these narratives are efforts to downplay foreignness and integrate strangers into the newly conquered territory, it must be admitted that these stories could do better. So, okay, marriage to a local princess can certainly help localize a king, but what are we to make of the abundant details which not only repeatedly stress the ruler's foreign birth, but at times document his humble status, the wild location of his upbringing, and often his extremely violent temperament. So what do Salons do differently? Well, Salons, first and foremost, he takes stranger narratives from a wide spectrum of pre-modern societies and excavates their underlying cultural assumptions on the nature of power and kingship. This monumental comparative project leads to some key general observations. Now, although there are many details outlined by Salons in the numerous works and stranger kingships, I will outline three that I consider to be the most important. So the first is that the king comes from elsewhere. The second is that usurpation itself is the principle of legitimacy. And the final one is that conquest or not, the kingdom is established by contract. So let's break down each one of these claims. The first general characteristic is highly surprising. As Belgian anthropologist Luc de Huysch puts it, based on his longstanding research on African kingdoms, the king comes from elsewhere. Now, elsewhere, we should stress, can mean multiple things. So kings may have separate origins from the rest of humanity, they may have a divine or semi-divine ancestor, or, as often happens, they may simply be of different ethnic origin to the people they rule. But the key detail here, as Salons emphasizes, is that royalty is the foreigner. The second general feature of Salons is rather polemic as the second general feature, as Salons rather polemically states it, is that usurpation itself is the principle of legitimacy. Now, it is perhaps worth giving Salons a certain leeway here. The claim that usurpation is the principle of legitimacy does not exclude that some members, particularly royal members of societies with stranger king legends, may also possess an ideal of father to son succession. Arguably, however, when it comes to stranger kingdoms, any form of succession is legitimate only so far as it preserves the original power of the founder, and I'll return to this later. But before that, what makes the founder so special anyway? Well, being an outsider has its advantages. So Salons fre frequently emphasizes that the stranger king may draw on widely held ideas associating power, and often supernatural power, with geographical distance. 
Comparative, comparativist Mary Helms, for example, describes how those who create and or acquire goods and benefits from some dimension of the cosmological outside are not only providing goods and benefits per se, but are also presenting tangible evidence that they themselves possess or command the unique qualities and ideals generally expected in persons who have ties with distant places of supernatural origins and therefore are themselves second creators. Evidence of inalienable connections with places of cosmological origins does convey a certain sacrality, which readily translates into political ideological legitimacy and facilitates successful exercise of power. Now, other than associations with the supernatural outside, Stranger Kings can also give the royal aspirant an edge over his local competition. So many Stranger King narratives describe a pre-conquest state where the local aristocracy, unable to cooperate with each other, solicit a foreign king as an impartial mediator. For example, discussing a Sumatra oral, narrative, oral tradition on the solicitation of Mylai kings, Barbara and Dyer writes, on occasion it was impossible to reach a compromise, and in these cases it was necessary to have recourse to a higher authority. A familiar theme in legends throughout the area is thus the appeal to some distant ruler at a time of anarchy and discord. Though at times peaceful, as often or not, the would-be king's ability to impose order on conquered society is often through extreme acts of violence. And here, Salins generalizes based on the work of Belgian anthropologist Luc de Hoysch and his theorization known as the exploit. So Salins refers to how early actions of founding kings are often associated with acts of incest, parasite, and fratricide. So think, for example, of Romulus's murder of Remus. Again, according to Salins, these acts of creative violence are the sole prerogative of the foreigner. As Salins explains, his initial transgression puts him above and beyond society, alienating even from his own kin, but in so demonstrating that he is stronger than society, he is able to recreate it. In other words, when it comes to imposing a new order, be it peacefully or not, the stranger and his mastery of the magical outside is the person to do it. Okay. So the first two general features are that the king comes from elsewhere and that usurpation is a, I'm not going to say the principle of legitimacy. The third and final general feature I will discuss today is the contractual nature of kingship. So kings may use violence or deceit to win the throne, yet, Salins argues, neither is sufficient to maintain power. So stranger kings the world over instead favor the creation of a contract between foreign ruler and local subjects. Now, the most obvious manifestation of the contractual nature of stranger kingship is found in the foreigner's marriage to a local priestess. More than a political union, Sodom stresses that marriage is an instance of the domestication of the foreign king, where the king's often violent powers and even identity are domesticated by the conquered people. Thus, in many cases, the new kingdom retains its local name and the conquered natives retain privileged positions in the new hierarchy. So, for example, in the Indonesian island of Roti, anthropologist James Fox recounts how a compromise was reached between the stranger king Mabulan and the local ruler Pada Lalai. So I quote, in the end, Mabulan, who was demonstrated the cleverness required of a ruler, offers the following solution to divide their functions. He says, it would be good if I became Lord and you became head of the earth for succeeding generations. When men have filled the domain, I will rule them, and you may levy a tribute on the domain and take a portion of Yantar syrup from each person who lives in the domain. And for all time, since you were the first to settle this domain, this domain will be given the name Pada, in keeping with your name, Pada Lalai. In other words, in the island of Roti, kingship can be understood as a division of labor. Power over the people goes to Mabulan, whereas rulership of the earth and privileges, including the name of the kingdom, go to the local Pada Lalai. What results is the creation of a hybrid kingdom, which structurally can be described as a conjunction of oppositions, including male and female, celestial and terrestrial, violent and peaceful, mobile and rooted, stranger and native. So, what has all this got to do with Herodotus? Okay, so for a start, from Lydia's Heraclid kingship onwards, there's no shortage of stranger kings to be found in the histories. And if we cycle through every king in the histories, as perhaps some of you are doing now, um, I'm sure that some kings and some tyrants would appear stranger than others. Nonetheless, I believe the list would be extensive. 
However, rather than cite more examples, I'd like to focus on an extended case study, Herodotus's account of Cyrus the Great, and use this as a means for exploring the potential benefits and problems which arise from adopting Solon's comparative model. And I chose to focus on Herodotus' description of Cyrus for many reasons. So first, it's useful due to its familiarity. Second, its length and detail allow us to assess the strengths and weaknesses of Solon's model. And finally, and perhaps most obviously, Cyrus's narrative has many of the hallmarks of Solon's stranger king. Indeed, while Solon does not discuss Cyrus in any detail, he at least mentions him in a brief summary of Johann uh, Georges von Hahn's discussion of the hero legend, which is on the right hand side. Now, before I begin, I should also note that although my, although my discussion will predominantly focus on Herodotus, I will occasionally refer to alternate takes in Cyrus's life. Indeed, Herodotus himself claims to know another three versions of Cyrus's story, and competing narratives actually survive in Xenophon's Education of Cyrus and Ctesias's Persica, which is partially preserved in a text by Nicolaus of Damascus. The Greek, source, the Greek sources also appear alongside a growing number of Near Eastern inscriptions, which though often lacking in detail, further complicate our understanding of Cyrus, and at times shed doubt on details of Herodotus' account. Now, although time constraints will necessitate that I sidestep a number of major historical debates, I would like to stress that even if the Greek sources do not always coincide with what really happened, as some modern historians reconstructed, Herodotian divergences cannot be unproblematically equated with Greek error. As I will analyze it, Herodotus' Cyrus has all the hall hallmarks of an oral history, which though in part Greek, is also entirely congruent with Near Eastern legends and oral history. In this respect, as Munson puts it, even some of Herodotus' inaccuracies are illuminating as they are rooted in Persian traditions or discourse. And it is primarily in this aspect that I will try to reconstruct my reading. So our journey begins with Herodotus' description of how the Median kingship was first established by a clever man enamored of sovereignty. And this man, of course, is Dioces. Now, Dioces, through a combination of litigious acumen and a shrewd nature, he manages to take the throne and develops a model of kingship which Cyrus will one day inherit. Now, the most relevant aspects for this presentation of Dioces' kingship, they include a series of prescriptions limiting access to the king, including that no one should come into the presence of the king, that the king should be seen by no man, and that it is a disgrace to laugh or spit in his presence. Herodotus explains that the Oces instituted these practices that, so that men of his own age, who have been bred up with him and were as nobly born and as equals in many excellences, might, by reason of not seeing him, deemed him be, to be changed from what he had been. Now, although the median narrative and institutions described by Herodotus are, are often considered implausible by historians, on a literary and ideological level, there is perhaps an irony that Dioces, though not an inch a stranger, created the ideal of the king as other, as an outsider, and in some respects paved the way for foreign conquest. Now, skipping over the other Median kings, let's flash forward to the rule of Astyages and a peculiar dream concerning how his daughter, Mandane, urinated and drowned all of Asia. Now, the Median royal priests, the Magi, and we'll have a good deal more to say about these figures shortly, they, were evident they evidently interpreted that the dream prophesied that Mandane would bear a child who would displace Astyages. So in order to prevent this, the Median king avoids marrying Mandani to a Mede, i.e. and someone who in his view would, be, would give rise to a legitimate successor, and instead marries her to a Persian, Cambyses. Astyages attempt to neutralize the threat, however, was unsuccessful. He later has a second dream where vines grow from Mandani again, covering all Asia. Unfortunately, Mandani at this stage is already pregnant, and Astyages then orders that her future child must be eliminated. As so often happens in these stories, the shepherd who was tasked with exposing the child switches the infant and cares for Cyrus himself. In the course of a village game, Cyrus is elected as king by the local children and promptly whips a disobedient mead. When Astyages' attention is drawn to the events, he instantly recognizes Cyrus's noble origins. Although Astyages experienced mixed emotions, his fears are somewhat assuaged by the Magi who inform him that since the prophecy came to pass in the children's game, he now has nothing to fear. Cyrus is therefore allowed to live and returns to his biological parents in Persia. 
Now, before continuing with Herodotus' narrative, it's worth reflecting on Cyrus's credentials as a stranger king. So certainly Cyrus is in part Persian and in this respect, in part stranger. Yet he's also notably the son of Mandane, a Mede. In the riddling words of the Delphic Oracle, Cyrus is a mule. And this arguably gives him a foot in the door from the beginning and detracts somewhat from his stranger origins. Um, the detail does not, however, appear to contradict Cyrus's association with the, with the outside. So Herodotus's narrative actually repeatedly stresses Cyrus's external origins and at times even hints that he had something more than human about him in his nature. So, for example, alongside Cyrus's literally stranger father, his childhood takes place both outside of the court and indeed outside of civilized society. So Cyrus is specifically said to be exposed in the mountainous area most frequented by wild beasts. We also have hints at a supernatural element in his upbringing, and Herodotus is clearly aware of legends by, which state that the young child was raised by a dog, a misunderstanding which, according to the father of history, was influenced by the name of his foster mother, Spaco, the median for dog. Furthermore, Cyrus's foreign status is something repeatedly stressed by the Medes. So the Magi, for example, are emphatic in this, noting in Book 1, 120, that Cyrus is a Persian and the Persians are foreigners. And finally, it should be stressed that the mixed ethnic status of Cyrus is not actually an essential detail of this hero tale. And Ctesias, for example, records an alternate account where Cyrus has no median connection, but creates one through his marriage with Astyages' daughter, Amatus. Having said all this, if Cyrus is marked as an outsider, his mixed origins also clearly play a role in affirming his place as the median king. This, however, is an additional detail which complements his status as a stranger rather than negating it. So as the son of a Persian, Cambyses, Cyrus is a child raised in the wild and even supernatural circumstances. And in this respect, Cyrus possesses all the advantages that go with this status, with the status as a stranger. However, as the son of Mandane, on the other hand, Cyrus is a combination of local and foreign elements and a representative of the dual kingdom he will go on to create. In other words, Cyrus's mule origins anticipate the union between local and foreign, which, which in Salon's words, form the contractual origins of stranger kingship everywhere. Now, despite this anticipation prior to his conquest, Cyrus's dual status exists as a potential only at this stage. Indeed, nothing in his, par his parentage guarantees his status as the median king. This is a title he must earn through conquest as an outsider. Okay, so to resume, our, to resume our narrative. So Cyrus, prior to his conquest of Medea, is living a Persian lifestyle with his parents in his father's native land. When he comes of age, he's then contacted by a Median nobleman, Harpagus, who for good reason dislikes Astyages. So this Harpagus, he wishes to exact revenge upon the Median king and encourages Cyrus to usurp the throne. Harpagus further, further informs Cyrus that he has sown the seeds of revolt among the Median noblemen. Now, evidently, Astyages was a harsh, a picros ruler to more than one of his Median subjects. The ensuing battle is something of a walkover. And Herodotus' words, the sooner had the Medes marched out and joined battle with the Persians, then some of them deserted to the enemy, but most of them of set purpose played the coward and fled. Now, this idea that the Medes willingly handed over the kingdom to a foreigner may seem fanciful and even a complete distortion of a bloodier reality. And maybe it was, although some independent sources confirmed the Herodotus' account. But once again, what I want to stress is that Herodotus' narrative is less about what really happened, but how events were understood within local cultural conceptions of kingship and power. So the question then is not what really happened, but what does the Median reception of Cyrus say about native understandings of kingship? And what precisely did the Medes expect to gain through their submission to a stranger? So what can Cyrus do for the Medes? Well, a lot, I think. So Cyrus the foreigner may actually not be such a strange choice. So for a start, the quality it brings to the kingdom are clear. So Cyrus is a tried and tested leader. He has close associations with the divine outside, a sharp and agile mind, and a handsome physical appearance, all notably royal characteristics. More importantly, Cyrus possesses the otherness that Theoses first established for the Median throne but lacked himself. In short, Cyrus has all the hallmarks of a stranger king and the, and the creative imperial powers that go with it. So what kind of kingdom does Cyrus create and how strange is it? 
So as earlier noted, a key element of Salem's stranger king politics insists that ideally kingship is not based on domination, but on the creation of a contractual kingdom involving a division of labor between the stranger king and his native subjects. In structural terms, stranger kingdoms can be understood as a combination of two distinct people and a marriage of male and female, celestial and terrestrial, violent and peaceful, mobile and rooted, stranger and native, and so on. Though the evidence is often not as rich as we would like, Herodotus's description of the Persian kingdom, and we'll see other sources agree with this in part, may be interpreted in terms of such a conjunction of oppositions. Indeed, initially, initially at least, the Persian and the Medes seem to have little in common. As Herodotus tells it, they were two separate ethnoi. Furthermore, these two ethnic groups are associated with different ways of life and Median wealth, luxury, and effeminacy are, star effeminacy are, star are starkly contrasted with the early Persian herdsmen who wear leather trousers, drink water instead of wine, and generally lack all good things. It is, of course, Cyrus who brings these distinct ways of life together and does it in a way that preserves elements from both Persian and Median society. So the first notable feature is found in the name of the kingdom itself. So Cyrus's rise to power at least as Herodotus and other Greeks tell it, is not so much a story of the expansion of the Persian Empire as it is of Cyrus's inheritance of the existing Median kingdom. Indeed, for Herodotus and the Greeks in general, as well as a number of Hebrew sources, it is often difficult to say where the boundaries between the Medes and the Persians start and end. So Herodotus, for example, he often speaks of post-conquest Cyrus as king of the Medes. And this is only really scratches at the surface of the confusing and often interchangeable usage of Medes and Persians in the Greek tradition. Now, without getting into the complexities of the archaeological debates on wider Near Eastern and Elamite influences on Cyrus's kingship, I stress that in Herodotus's version, at least, it is not so fanciful to speak of Cyrus's kingdom as the merging of two distinct ways of life and the formation of a contractual kingdom. So secondly, we see the contractual nature of Cyrus's empire and the role native women occupy in Persian kingship. Now for Solons as noted, a common and even central element in stranger kingdoms is that royal power is created through affinity, i.e. through the marriage of the stranger to a local wife and the birth of children who are sons-in-law to the conquered people. And because of this, in stranger politics, native women, as Solons puts it, constitute the bond between the foreign intruders and the local people and they generally retain elevated status in creation of kingship thereafter. Now, in Herodotus's version of the events, the marriage between foreign and local takes place, of course, not with Cyrus, but with his father Cambyses' marriage to Mandane. And there is, for this reason, no need for Cyrus, who is already the son-in-law of Astyages, to repeat it. In Ctesias, however, where Cyrus has no prior relations to Medea, Power is indeed cemented through Cyrus's marriage to Astyage's daughter, Amethyst. Xenophon Cyrus combines both details. Although Cyrus is a son of Mandane, he nonetheless marries his cousin, an anonymous daughter of Astyage's son. Tellingly, Xenophon notes that Cyrus receives all Medea as a dowry. Now, despite the notable differences in, in the examples, in all, all cases, we see a clear emphasis on the importance of native women in the creation of a new empire and they act as a bridge between conqueror and conquered. The third feature of I want to talk about in Cyrus's Stranger Kingdom is that um, in addition to the marriage of local women, the contractual nature of the Persian and Median kingship is evident in the continuing importance of the Medeans in political and military rule. While it is now clear that the Persians are on top, the Medes nonetheless retain a number of powerful positions, stressing their privileged position or the privileged role in the new empire. Astyages, for example, despite his cruelty, is allowed to live. And other notable Medes include Mazaris, who, su who suppressed the revolt of the Lydian Pactes, Harpagus, and later Darius's, Darius's general, Takmasapada, and Datis the Mede. Um, the fourth point I want to point out is that local power is further evidenced in the Persian adoption of Median cultural ways of life. Indeed, for Herodotus, this isn't surprising as the Persians are described as cultural magpies. And unsurprisingly, his Cyrus adopts many aspects of Median royal lifestyle, Median royal culture and Median clothing. Um, and this is also something that's also described in detail by Xenophon. And actually, if we're to believe Strabo, the Persians adopted almost every aspect of their culture from the Medes. Fifth, and finally, 
early religious institutions. And here I want to be careful to avoid debates on the precise nature of early Persian religion that may also suggest an important division of labor. So in Cyrus's new kingdom, power over the people and actually sometimes over the weather as well, may be the preserve of the king, but the, Mede, but the Medes continue to hold religious sway over the land through the Magi. Although the ethnic origins of the Magi are not agreed upon by historians, Herodotus describes them as one of six Median tribes and repeatedly, in fact, opposes the Magi to Persian ethnicity. Indeed, the Magi even appear as a continuing source of tension to the Persian king's authority. So consider, for example, Smyrdas and his brother's attempt to usurp Persian kingship. Indeed, Persian suspicion was even memorialized in the so-called ritual massacre of the Magi, where, as Her Herodotus notes, as long as the festival lasts, no magus may go outdoors, but during this day, the Magi remain in their houses. Now, despite this ambivalence, it is of no small importance that the Magi retain central roles in sacrifices, the interpretation of royal dreams and omens, and even act as royal advisors. Indeed, the Magi even seem to have occupied a central ritual role in initiating the king and domesticating his stranger status. Now, notably, this passage is not from Herodotus, and in this respect, I'm cheating somewhat, but given its details, the digression, I think, is worthwhile. So Plutarch writes, a little while after the death of Darius, the new king made an expedition to Parzagade that he might receive the royal initiation at the hands of the Persian priests. Here, there is a sanctuary of a warlike goddess whom one might conjecture to be Athena. Into this sanctuary, the candidate for initiation must pass, and after laying aside his own proper robe, was put on that which Cyrus the Elder used to wear before he became king. Then he must eat a cake of figs, choose some turpentine or terebinth wood, and drink a cup of sour milk. Whatever else is done, whatever else is done besides this is unknown to outsiders. Now, the rite described by Plutarch is more than a symbolic ceremony. It is, in his words, a telete, an initiation or ritual involving the transformation of the participant. Comparatively speaking, this would not be uncommon. So, for example, the installation of the Mexica king involves his ritual humiliation by the autochthonous priests and his eventual domestication from outsider to insider. So asylum documents in the case of the Mexica king, he is first stripped naked, he is deprived of all signs of rank, status and property and placed in a state of weakness. His body is then decorated with a skull and crossbone symbolizing death. He is then like he is then likely secluded for a period of some days prior to being reintroduced prior to being reintroduced into society. So as Salins notes, everything thus happens as if the heir to the kingship goes through a symbolic death, rebirth, and growth to maturity, which is also a domestication of the foreign prince by the indigenous authorities. Now the basics of the ritual described by Plutarch they broadly echo these details. The starting point tellingly involves the stripping of the king's previous identity and the donning of Cyrus's pre-conquest clothing. The priests thus remind the king to be of his outsider status and dependence and local elites and affirm his power. The king is then required to eat and drink a special diet of figs, terrapent and sour milk. Now, the exact meaning of these foods is unclear. Um, though intoxicating drinks are often part of royal installation rituals, but these foods, they, they may just be examples of quintessentially Persian peasant foods. So the Persians were sometimes actually called terrible eaters as an insult. And alongside sour milk, these may be just part of a humiliating reminder of the king's early origins. Now, after the seclusion and the unknown aspects of this ritual, which may include further ritual humiliation and even the physical beating of the king, if the Mesopotamian Tamian Akitu festival is anything to go by, the king was likely given a new robe. Now this new robe in contrast to Cyrus's earlier Persian dress may have been of Median origin. So in Xenophon's rendition of Cyrus's rise to power, the Median a Median robe it was bestowed by Astyages to Cyrus alongside the hand of his daughter as part of his inheritance of the Median kingship. Um, now many of these details are obscure, but the ritual, the ritual Plutarch describes in many respects is strikingly, strikingly recreate Cyrus's journey from a Persian stranger to a Median king, a reminder to each subsequent successor of the king's ultimate foreign origins and obligations to local powers who initiate him. Okay, so wrapping things up. 
So having discussed Solomon's observations on the key characteristics of stranger kings, Cyrus's stranger origins, the Cy and Cyrus's creation of an empire through contract rather than conquest, by way of conclusion, I'd like to reflect on what we actually gain through understanding Cyrus through the lens of the stranger king and anticipate some possible objections. So for, for a start, some of you may be wary of the unapologetically comparative nature of Solomon's discussion. And at least since Edmund Leach, this kind of research is often dismissed as butterfly collecting, best left to the pages of Fraser's Golden Bough. Silence, however, rather than an act of uncontrolled compar comparison, interprets his, re his research in Kings as an example of controlled generalization. So quoting Leach in a related context, Silence argues that Generalization is inductive. It consists in perceiving possible general laws and circumstances of particular cases. It is guesswork, a gamble. You may be wrong or you may be right. But if you happen to be right, you've learned something altogether new. Um, even so, it may be argued that if we approach the ancient evidence with a stranger king mold, we're likely to find just that. And again, I would agree with this in part, and it is indeed a risk. But against that, I'd like to stress that we actually rarely, we rarely approach evidence neutrally, especially when it comes to saying what kings should and should not be doing. So the first point is to stress that yes, Solomon's approach is generalizing, but it may nonetheless be useful. The second point I want to consider is what kind of explanation stranger kings actually provide. Indeed, given the generality of Solomon's observations, it may seem that applying a stranger king paradigm risks glossing over unique cultural differences. And perhaps again, it does to a degree. However, as I understand it, detecting elements of stranger kingship does not exhaust local cultural understandings. What it offers is a much more general set of cultural assumptions, often held on a popular level, on the basic nature of power and state formation. And thus, it can complement rather than replace more detailed ideological explorations of kingship, such as that provided by Bruce Lincoln, for example, on the Achaemenid kingship, kingship in terms of Zoroastrian ideology. Now, bearing these two caveats in mind, how useful is Salem's concept? Well, ultimately, I'm going to leave that for you to decide. But unsurprisingly, I believe that there is use to it. There is use for it. So the Stranger King, it adds a general but useful dimension when it comes to making sense of the cultural understanding of royal power that underlies Cyrus's kingdom and his reception among the people he conquered. And this perhaps is no small contribution. Indeed, interpretations of Cyrus's action and the legends surrounding his birth have been frequently interpreted, have been interpreted in countless ways, ranging from Cyrus the multiculturalist to Cyrus the shrewd manipulator of local legends. Now, the multiculturalist Cyrus is often dismissed as anachronistic, and I think rightly so. Yet we need to be equally cautious of what we mean when we attribute ideological manipulation to Cyrus. So consider, for example, Kurt, who argues that the stranger narratives discussed today were manipulated to strengthen shaky claims to royal power, or more recently, Waters, who discusses Cyrus's origin stories as echoes of original propaganda propagated in conjunction with Cyrus's real conquest of the Medes and efforts to legitimize himself in the Median dynastic, dynast dynastic tradition. Now, there is no doubt that a savvy ruler like Cyrus could exploit local legends to his own benefit. Yet, as noted earlier, legitimation is always only a partial answer and at times a problematic one. Indeed, what these interpretations often neglect is that to claim is that for a claim to be legitimizing at all, it first requires that it has currency within local current cultural orders. And moreover, there is no reason to reject that Cyrus himself was as much part of those cultural orders as were his subjects. In short, any form of legitimizing first requires an understanding of the cultural order through which legitimizing is expressed. Thus, rather than understanding Cyrus as a master of underlying and universal real politic, it may be better to understand adopting Salins's phrase and cast him as a master of the real politics of the marvelous, a figure who was born within particular cultural assumptions and ruled and conquered through particular cultural assumptions. Now, we've already discussed at length Cyrus's stranger birth and, contractual, and the contractual kingdom, but before finishing, it might be worthwhile to briefly reflect on two further examples which illustrate the widespread currency of Cyrus's stranger politics, and do so usefully in a demonstrably non-Greek context, namely his reception in the Babylonian and Hebrew sources. Now, as both of these examples have been briefly linked to Silence's framework by Bruce Lincoln, and I've already perhaps spoken a little bit too much, I'll be quick. 
So in Babylon, the evidence is chiefly derived from the Cyrus Cylinder and the Nabonidus Chronicle, both of which emphasize a similar stranger king trajectory and document how the wayward, though legitimately born king, Nabonidus, is abandoned by the god Marduk and seemingly also his Babylonian priests. Marduk, in turn, finds a new favorite in a strange land. So the cylinder documents. Marduk searched all the land, seeking according to his heart's wish, a righteous ruler whose hand he would grasp. He pronounced the name Cyrus, he pronounced the name of Cyrus, king of Anshan. The divinely chosen Cyrus is subsequently welcomed by local elites, but open arms. The cylinder continues. All the, all the people of Babylon, the entirety of Sumer and Akkad, nobles and governors, they bowed before Cyrus. They kneeled, they kissed his feet, they rejoiced in his kingdom and their faces glowed. In short, order is brought to Babylon through a divinely ordained but clearly foreign king. Now, Cyrus is even more emphatically received in a number of Jewish accounts, which frames Cyrus not simply as a stranger king, but as a stranger messiah. As Isaiah puts it, thus saith the Lord who is anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held them, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall, be, shall not be shut. And the praise goes on. Now, these texts, of course, express propaganda from both the conquering and the conquered parties and should be read with as much suspicion as Herodotus's account. In fact, that all the Babylonians and Jews did not agree with this lavish praise is clearly suggested by rebellions following Cyrus's glorious reception. Thus, clearly, if we take these texts at face value, we risk glossing over what may well have been a more brutal colonial conquest. And Solon's is frequently criticized for this very reason, particularly when it comes to encounters between Western colonial powers and indigenous islanders. So take Captain Cook, for example. However, the risk of glossing over a more complex reality was also to be tempered by the risk of erasing native exegesis. As David Henley puts it, much more common is the converse tendency to assume that whenever foreigners have been in power, their power must have been more or less illegitimate. And this, I think, nicely captures what, what we have been discussing today. So when it comes to stranger kings, legitimacy is, of course, a debated idea. Yet it is debated within local cosmological understandings of power, which may be very different from our own. So displaced and threatened rulers have good reason to resist figures like Cyrus, yet priests and dissatisfied aristocrats like Harpagus have equally good reason to welcome them. And both groups can cite good cosmological reasons to affirm their views. Rulers can point to the ties to an illustrious, albeit often stranger ancestor, while priests can point to the superior qualities of the newly divinely chosen stranger. And ultimately, if stranger narratives teach us anything, it is that legitimacy is something debated. And this is no lesson, and one that Cyrus and many others may have well learned from the Near East's greatest stranger king, Sargon, um, a ruler whose very name quite conveniently means legitimate king. Now, it could be that Sargon created this title as a means of justifying his rule and concealing his humble and foreign origins. Yet if this really was his aim, he certainly had a funny way of doing so. Indeed, why would he or anyone else attempt to conceal their foreignness through a long account of a supernatural childhood documenting his foreign birth, paternal relatives living in the hills, an extensive period spent in the wild? On the other hand, perhaps Sargon had every reason to embrace his foreign status. That is, if we accept that usurpation, given the right circumstances, can be a form of legitimacy. Thank you.